Our first reading today is Psalms 8. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands and you have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our sovereign. Second reading is from John chapter 16, verses 12 through 15. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said, that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Amen. Good morning again. I am Richard Bolin, and I like to tell stories. I've been a preacher for a while, 41 years. I retired last July from uh, my last church, Trinity United Methodist Church in Los Osos. And I've been worshiping here for a while. You know, I'm kind of staying out of the hair of my successor there at, at, in Los Osos. So we drive from Los Osos up the grade and joined a wonderful choir. So I've been kind of keeping a low profile profile there in the back row of the choir. So maybe you, uh, a couple of people were saying, now, who are you again and where are you from? <laughs> Kay and I, have a, she gets to sit up in the front row. I'm very pleased that Pastor Diane has coaxed me out of the choir to be a guest preacher for one of her vacation Sundays. This retirement thing I'm still figuring out, trying to, what, what's my identity now? I think of myself as a former preacher aspiring to be a storyteller. The distinction may be subtle. Generally, a preacher makes a point and then illustrates it with a story. Whereas a storyteller, I think, just tells a story and allows the listeners to ponder multiple meanings that that story might have. It's kind of like being, uh, it's kind of like the Sunday school teacher who was um, brand new and, and when one of the children got home, the, ch the parents asked, well, how's the new teacher? He says, well, you mean the lady without any morals? And I said, what do you mean by that? He says, well, our, our, the last Sunday school teacher would always tell a story and when the story was over, she'd say, and the moral of the story is. But this... <laughs> But this Sunday school teacher just tells a story and leaves it there, so she doesn't have any morals. So I'm aspiring to be a preacher without morals now. Today is Trinity Sunday, admittedly a challenging topic for a storyteller. I mean, we've got um, Christmas, there's a story for Christmas. We've got Easter, there's a story for Christmas. We had Pentecost last Sunday, there's a story for Pentecost. And then you get to, the Sunday after Pentecost is always Trinity Sunday. And it's, it's not a story, it's a doctrine. Um, but 
Nevertheless, a story comes to mind. In northern Russia, a bishop was sailing from the port of Archangel to the, to the monastery on Solovetsk Island in the middle of the White Sea. I had to look that up on the map. There are actual places. And there's a legend told about this bishop's voyage uh, in the Volga district of Russia. And uh, at some point, Leo Tolstoy picked up on it and re recorded it in a book of stories. On this same vessel with the bishop, there were other religious pilgrims, there were fishermen, and then the captain and the crew. And so during the days of this voyage, the bishop um, made acquaintances with uh, the people on board and heard the stories that they had to tell. And they were going past a particular island, and one of the fishermen said, you know, there's, there's three hermits that live on that island, and said, yeah, we've, we've heard of that. Some of the people have heard of that, but we didn't know if it was true. He says, oh, yes, they're really there. I, I was uh, uh, in a storm one night, and I got lost, and I ended up shipwrecked on this, on this island, and I didn't know where I was, and I went walking, and I found an earthen hut, and there was an old man an ancient old man standing outside the hut, and then two others came out of the hut. They fed him, they helped repair his boat, and they helped him back on his way. But what are they like? The bishop wanted to know. What, what are these three hermits like? And so he described three elderly men, one who was certainly over a hundred, they dressed simply, they had long beards, and they spoke very few words. One of them would just give a glance, and the others would seem to know what was being said, what was meant. I asked the tallest how long they had been there, and he mumbled something, and he seemed to get agitated, almost angry, and then the, the oldest just took his hand and smiled, and he calmed down, and then he smiled at me, and he said, have mercy upon us. The bishop was so intrigued by this fisherman's story about the three hermits that he prevailed upon the captain of the ship to go over next to the island and lay anchor, and then to uh, take him in a boat to, to row up to the shore, which they did. And when, when they got there, those three elderly uh, hermits were waiting for them. I have heard, said the bishop, that you godly men live here saving your own souls and no doubt praying for others. I, an unworthy servant of Christ, I wish to see you, servants of God, and, and perhaps see if I might teach you, if I might uh, share something of the gospel with you, because that's my job as a bishop. I am to care for the souls of the people. Well, the old men looked at each other and they smiled and they didn't say anything. Tell me, said the bishop, what are you doing to save your souls? How, how are you serving God in this place? Well, the second hermit just kind of sighed and, and the oldest hermit spoke, very ancient. He smiled. We do not know how to serve God here in this place. We just serve each other. But how do you pray to God? Asked the bishop. Oh, we pray in this way, replied the old man. Three are ye, three are we. Have mercy on us. And as he said it, the, all three of them looked, or, looked up to the sky. Three are ye, three are we. Have mercy upon us. <laughs> the bishop kind of laughed at that. You have, you've, evidently, you've evidently heard something about the Holy Trinity, he said. Ah, yes, the Trinity. The bishop was well versed in the doctrine of the Trinity. He had read many theological papers on it. He'd even written about it himself. You don't find the Trinity explained in the Bible. 
um, it's, a, it's a doctrine that the church, as the church tries to make sense out of the Bible, make sense of God, make sense of the mystery, the majesty, the, the, the eternal presence, the, the closeness of God. So theologians work on these things, and, you, and, and the church has affirmed the Trinity uh, since, it, since the early centuries. The bishop thought about places like the 16th chapter of the Gospel of John, where Jesus sounds pretty Trinity-like. He assures his disciples that, that the Holy Spirit's continuing presence will be with them. I still have many things to say to you. Jesus is, is telling them in his farewell address. He's not going to be with them in, in bodily form much longer. I, I, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them. So the spirit of truth will come. And, and then in that, that last verse uh, that was read for us this morning the 15th verse of that chapter, Jesus packs enough Trinitarian hints to keep theologians busy for centuries. All that the Father has is mine. Hmm. There you got the Father and the Son and interesting relationship. And he and the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, the Holy Ghost, whatever name you will give it, he, he will come and share all that is mine, declare it to all of you. That one verse not only references Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it also tells us that the Trinitarian God is a God who relates, a God who relates to creation, to God's own creation. The doctrine of the Trinity affirms the ways in which human beings have experienced the divine as creator, the parent of all things, in the flesh in Jesus Christ, and as the sustaining presence of the Holy Spirit. God is with us. Come to think of it, that's the story of Christmas. God is with us. That's the story of Easter. God is alive. God is with us. That's the story of Pentecost, the flames coming down, the wind blowing, the Spirit touching us, God is with us. God, and that is what the, the doctrine of the Trinity is about. God is with, God is not aloof and far off. God relates to us, God is with us. That might have been a point that the bishop would make if he decided to preach to these three hermits. See, I almost got the preaching there for a minute. But he wasn't going to take that much time to try and explain the whole doctrine of the Trinity to these three old men alone on an island. It would be enough, the bishop thought, it would be enough if he could just teach them a proper prayer. You have evidently heard something about the Holy Trinity, he said. But you do not pray aright. You have won my affection, godly men, and, and so I see that you wish to please the Lord, but you do not know how to serve him. So that's not the way to pray, but listen to me. I will teach you. I will teach you not just the way that I know to pray, but the way that God has taught us in the Holy Scriptures. For, and, and for God has... Uh, come to us in God's Son, Jesus, and he taught us how to pray. And he said, Our Father. And so he turned, and, and the oldest man, he says, Repeat after me, Our Father. And the oldest one said, Our Father. And then the next one said, Our Father. And then the tallest one said, Our Father. And then the priest said, Which art in heaven? And the oldest one said, which art in heaven? And the next one mumbled something. And the third one could hardly talk because his beard had grown so much over his mouth that his words were very... In, in fact, the oldest one, he didn't have any teeth. And a lot of what he said was kind of mumbled and indistinct. So the, the priest went over, the bishop went over and over with it that day. He spoke words and waited for them to repeat them. He sat down on the rock. They sat looking at him, intent on his lips, trying their hardest. And a word would be said, 
20 times, 30 times, 100 times, and, and they began to say the whole Lord's Prayer. He labored from sunup till, till sundown so until they could say the whole thing, not only repeating it after him, but on their own. The bishop did not leave until it was, it was getting dark, and then the moon was rising over the ocean. And he finally bid them farewell. They knelt down before him, and he raised them up, gave them a kiss, and he said, continue to uh, pray and serve here in this place. And he got back on his, his little boat and rowed over to the ship. It was late. Most aboard the ship were tired, and they went to sleep as the crew unfurled the sails and set swiftly across the moonlit ocean. The bishop did not wish to sleep. He sat alone thinking about his day, thinking of these good old men. He thought of how pleased they had been to learn the Lord's Prayer, and he thanked God for having sent him to, to uh, be able to teach these men as he did. Suddenly, out across the sea, he saw something shining. What is that, a, a seagull in the, in the moonlight? a little gleaming sail, perhaps, of a boat, a small boat. The bishop fixed his eyes upon it. It must be a boat sailing after us, but, but it's overtaking us very, very quickly, very rapidly. It was far, far away a minute ago, but now it is much nearer. It cannot be a boat, for I can see no sail. But whatever it may be, it is following us. It is catching up to us. And he could not make out what it was, not a boat, nor a bird, nor, nor a fish. Well, it was bigger than a man, but it certainly it couldn't be a man anyway out there in the middle of the ocean. He rose and he said to the helmsman, look there, what, what is that, my friend, what is it? But even as he said that last word, he saw what it was. The three hermits running across the sea, coming to the boat. Their gray beards were shining. They were white and gleaming. They approached the ship as quickly as if it were not moving at all. The, ste the, the steersman looked and he let go of the helm in terror. Oh Lord, the, the hermits are running after us and the, on the water as if it were dry land. The passengers hearing him, they jumped up and they crowded to the stern and they saw the hermits coming along hand in hand with the one on either side beckoning the ship to stop and and they, they arrived there at the ship even before it stopped. And all three, as one voice, called out, We have forgotten your teaching, servant of God. As long as we kept repeating it, we remembered. But when we stopped saying it for a time, a word dropped out, and, and, and then it went all to pieces. We can remember nothing of it. Teach us again. The bishop remembered what Jesus had said about, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. And he thought how often in his life he thought he had all the answers. The bishop crossed himself. He looked, he leaned over the ship's side and he said, just say, three are ye, three are we, have mercy upon us. It is not for me to teach you. Pray for us sinners. And the bishop bowed low before the old men, and they turned and they went back across the sea. A light shone until daybreak at the last place that they were seen. God is with us. And God is continually surprising us. Teaching us new things. 
teaching us humility. Oh, I'm preaching again. <laughs> oh, Lord, have mercy upon us.